Uh, my name is Ramo Naidu, and we're going to talk about uh, clunial nerve, peripheral nerve stimulation using the SPR therapeutic system. And to my left is James. James, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. So my name is James Lee. I am a pain medicine fellow hailing from Albany, New York, in upstate New York. All right. All the way from across the country. Thanks for being here, James. And he has some experience with this system, so we're going to let him do everything while I explain what the clunial nerves are. So I have here our friend uh, looking away, and as you can see, this is the ilium. The clunial nerves are these really small uh, web-like nerves that actually innervate parts of the ilium itself and the muscles near. There are described to be three to four different groups of clunial nerves. There is the superior clunial nerves, which ride along the superior aspect of the iliac crest. These are the nerves that are commonly affected when there's a bone marrow aspirate. Um, there are patients who get bone marrow aspirates for oncological reasons who develop chronic pain after that procedure, and that is from a superior clunial neuralgia, so right up here. Uh, looking down at the PSIS, posterior superior iliac spine, uh, the medial or middle clunial nerves run right lateral to that PSIS. Um, so if you have patients you, you think or suspect have sacroiliac joint dysfunction, this can be on the differential, and oftentimes you'll do a sacroiliac joint injection, you think that you know, you, you've met all the provocative tests for SI joint dysfunction, you do the injection, and boom, doesn't work at all. Your next step should be examining for middle clunial or medial clunial neuralgia. Uh, the, both of these nerves can commonly be affected after lumbar fusion uh, for reasons, frankly, that are quite unclear. And then inferior clunial nerves come in from the bottom, uh, less likely to be an issue, but this would innervate the, the inferior aspect of the buttock. So if patients have pain in that region, the differential would be ischial bursitis versus inferior clunial neuralgia. And then there are lateral clunial nerves that emanate actually from the L1, L2 branches uh, on the lateral aspect of the iliac crest. So if patients say they have mid-axillary line right along the iliac crest, that is something to suspect. The very unfortunate thing about clunial nerves is that they do not have their own international classification of disease codification. Um, so I'm actually going to push, we should all be pushing the World Health Organization to make that so. Because without that, we as physicians don't identify this as we should. Um, the incidence ranges from 2 to 15% of patients with buttock pain have a clunial nerve entrapment or a clunial nerve syndrome. So uh, I think this is an important discussion today because we're bringing awareness to this problem. Uh, and you may have patients who have failed everything else, L5-S1 disc, sacroiliac joints, and you're wondering why the heck do they have this buttock pain? Well, it could be clunial neuralgia, and the way you diagnose it is you do a local anesthetic diagnostic block in that region. Now the challenge is, is it isn't just one nerve you can see with the ultrasound or you put the needle there and you're gonna block it. It's a web of nerves as I mentioned. So you, you may have to do uh, an infiltration in the region that you suspect in order to diagnose. Um, and this has certainly been the case for patients where I have tried, no joke, like six different things in that region and nothing's working and then finally you're like, well, it could be this and then you do it and boom, uh, now you know what the diagnosis is and then you can go on to the next step, which uh, for me is peripheral nerve stimulation. <clears throat> Historically, you could try radiofrequency ablation, but if you think about the lesions of the radiofrequency ablations, even with the larger ones, cooled RF and what you saw from Stratus yesterday uh, or Nimbus, those lesions, you still have to do a lot of those to get to the clunial nerves. So with stimulation, especially with the product we're going to talk about today, you have a large uh, field of stimulation, so you're able to capture more of that nerve, and furthermore, you get long-term relief, not just you know, a few months or a few weeks, which can happen with radiofrequency ablation. So James is going to show us how to do it. Um, one thing I love about the SPR therapeutic system is its simplicity. Uh, if you know how to use a needle, then you know how to use the system. So we're going to show you this here. On our floral shot here, uh, Chris has taken an AP view. Um, so I, I, if you can put that up on the screen, that would be ideal. Uh, ben is working on that. So what you, what you may or may not be able to see as I describe it is that the ilium is in view. Um, so what we're going to first do is a, a superior clunial nerve, peripheral nerve simulation. So um, what we're going to do, and I'll have James do this, is we're going to identify a location um, right at the superior aspect of the iliac crest. So basically right here on the fluoro. Gotcha. Um, and then I'll give you all of the instruments necessary to fulfill this procedure. Great. I'll take a shot here. Shot. 
Perfect. And just a little bit inferior to that. Shot. Yep, and that's a little lateral, so you get the kind of the peak of it. Shot. I like that. Okay. So the reason we're going for this location with this system is because you have basically a centimeter radius of, of electrical stimulation. It uses monopolar stimulation. Um, if you're doing a diagnostic block, you may actually want to be more superior on the iliac crest okay. because you're going to be really focused on that. But the reason we're, we're dropping here is just because you have that field of stimulation. Wouldn't be wrong to go higher. It's just the only concern is you start to get some muscle twitch and, and whatever else. So now what you can do is obviously you'll use some local anesthetic and then uh, you will drop down with the introducer and stimulating probe. Sure. So what we do is we, we connect this probe to the patient. Go ahead, you can okay. proceed. Sure. And I'm just talking here. Sure. Um, so we connect this to a, a patch, which basically grounds the system to the patient that's connected to the patient like so. And then we there. go for it. Chris, picture there. Beautiful. And did you touch us there? Not yet. Okay. No. So as James touches bone there, picture. <clears throat> what, when he says, yep, I, I touched bone, we would turn on the stimulation. Picture. There is a remote control, uh, which I'll show you in this picture as soon as he... I'm actually on OS right now. Beautiful. Yeah. I like yeah. where you're at. So okay. um, take another shot there just to get a final. Perfect. And, and maybe we go to a little bit more superior along the, the rim. So if you want to just make that adjustment. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I like where your hub is, just not the tip. Picture there. Oh, no. Beautiful. Actually, that's perfect. I like okay. that. So we have this remote here, and so what we could do is start turning it up. Um, this is this is a unitless number. It goes zero through a hundred, um, which is basically a multiple of uh, the uh, amplitude and pulse width. the The frequency is fixed. You have two uh, modes of frequency: a higher frequency at 100 hertz and a lower frequency at 20. And so you're able to to convert between those two. And in these situations, we use the higher frequency for the nerve. Um, so once the patient sort of feels that stimulation in the region, then we're, we're really happy. Basically, the procedure is over with because you, you've identified the target. Sure. So now what we'll do is we'll take out that stimulating probe. Sure. And you can, you, what you'll notice is the stimulating probe comes out of the, the introducer just a little bit. So right now, that introducer is not on the bone, which is good because when we, when we put this in, we don't want to, boom, hit the bone. Um, you may shear to some degree the the lead if it too, if it's too close but you don't have to worry about that too much because the tip of the needle i don't know how well we can see this on the camera is a little bit extended beyond the the tine um, so if you notice inside this needle is the lead there's a little tine that sticks out that's what that's what keeps it anchored in the location that we put it in sure so now james is going to put that in okay. <clears throat> And, and no need to do, like bang it off the os, but it's okay to touch it. Yep, so he's gonna put that in, and it's gonna lock into the introducer. And then we'll again, with our MagSafe connector here, yep. we'll connect that back up. And then make sure that we have the same stimulation, just checking to make sure that we have that same sort of response from the patient, that we're getting a twitch. Yes, do you feel that? Uh, yes, I feel that in my area of my upper buttock. Great. That is that correspond to where your pain is. Perfect. And now what we'll do is we'll actually cut the lead. And then we're going to pop off the connector box. Beautiful. Okay. So this is the, yeah. the tricky. Yep. Sure. This is probably the hardest part of the procedure. <laughs> uh, so it requires some dexterity to pop off the connector box from the lead. Mm. No pressure, James, just the world is watching, that's all. <laughs> all right, here we go. Be wow, that was impressive. <laughs> Very impressive, he's done that before. <laughs> right. So now what we'll do is we'll hold pressure on the tip of the lead. Sure. Yep, and then you'll just pull the introducer out. So just hold firm pressure downwards, yep. And then what will happen is the lead will remain in place. Beautiful. Yes. All right, that's it, you can let that go. Sure. And then you'll connect that to the lead. Uh, yeah. We'll slide that over, perfect. And we don't generally do procedures through drapes, but in this situation, we're taking the liberty to do so, assuming good sterile technique, of course. Beautiful, and that's, come, that's gonna come to a, po a point, basically, where you have two centimeters of the lead out of the skin. Okay. So you'll, you'll swing that all the way down, don't, don't quite snap it down until you get to two centimeters of lead sticking out from the skin. Okay. 
Yep, and then once you get to two centimeters, snap it. <clears throat> and then you can cut off the excess lead on the back. Sure. Beautiful. And then we have this really nice adhesive, which actually is a cassette for the connector box. So you'll stick that uh, close to where you inserted the lead, put that in the connector box, place a drop of Dermabond or Exofin or whatever glue agent you're using right over the lead insertion site. And then what happens is uh, you place Tegaderm and the patient goes home. And the first dressing change, uh, often our reps are involved just to make sure that the lead doesn't pull out. And what's happening over the course of days is that lead is coiled in nature. And, and basically the fibrotic tissue is growing around it to prevent migration. So the first week is kind of the crucial point where you really want to take care not to pull out the lead. Uh, and then as the fibrous tissue grows in, the, the likelihood of migration or it falling out is extremely low. This system is meant to stay in the body for 60 days. That's the FDA labeling 60 days of treatment. What's unique about the system is that after those 60 days, often patients will go on to have long-term pain relief. Um, so the hypothesis there is that it's changing the chronification of pain. So the central nervous system is starting to understand what it's like to not have that peripheral nociception and therefore change for the long term. Ramo, any instances where you leave it in uh, less than 60 days or longer than 60 days? Great question. So that's the FDA labeling, and a lot of things we do, frankly, are outside of the labeling from the FDA. For example, epidural steroid injections. Every, every epidural steroid injection is technically off-label. Uh, there are situations I've done this beyond 60 days. So I have a, a case that we'll soon write up about a patient who had uh, a tumor of their femoral nerve and had no options, was on uh, chronic anticoagulation without the ability to be uh, off or antithrombotic. Um, so it was a really challenging situation. I was thinking about, do I do distal peripheral nerve stimulation, DRG stimulation, uh, chemical neurolysis, uh, and all of those options were just too risky because the tumor was basically in the pelvis in the femoral nerve. And so I ended up doing a transferaminal approach using this system, and because it's so easy using this 19-gauge um, needle, I took the risk with her being on clopidogrel, and she understood that, and we we're outside of the epidural space, frankly, so things were safe from an epidural hematoma standpoint. Patient did really, really well, was able to start walking again, um, was super happy, come off of her medications, and I actually left it in for six months. Oh, wow. Um, and she ended up having uh, immunotherapy, which actually, uh, dare I say, cured her tumor, and she's doing really well to this day. So it's an amazing story. It's great. Um, but this system really save the day, because I really had no other option for that particular patient. Well, excellent. Uh, questions from our audience uh, regarding uh, the colonial nerve, peripheral nerve stimulation. That was quite a nice demonstration. Well, Ramo, this is Neil. What's the battery life? Yeah, so this, this uh, patch is where the energy comes from, the extensa kit right here. And so you, your patients will have the ability to recharge one while using the other, um, so it buttons on. So basically, as long as you're recharging this appropriately, you get that back on, uh, depending on your energy needs as far as how high the stimulation is from the remote, um, patients will generally go for uh, two to three days per extensa uh, charge, and then you, know, you swap it out and put in another one. Excellent. Other questions from the audience? Go ahead. Uh, the question was, uh, do you like to use uh, periop uh, antibiotics uh, for the procedure? Great question. The, for this particular procedure, I do not. It's percutaneous. It is like doing uh, any peripheral nerve block. And so I do not use uh, pre or intra or post antibiotics. Uh, the incidence of infection is extremely low with this. And we attribute that to the lead design. Uh, because it's coiled, so the, uh, the uh, ability for pathogens to get in and around the skin is extremely low. Uh, if anything occurs, I, I think I've heard about maybe a, a very superficial cellulitis, uh, and that's about it managed with antibiotics at that time. But again, the incidence of infection is extremely, extremely low. Excellent. Uh, is it difficult to get approved uh, uh, from the insurance companies? So the, the CPT code we use for this procedure is 64555. <clears throat> hmm. 
And right now, uh, that is approved by Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Uh, most LCDs uh, allow for it. As Neil talked about yesterday, there are these MACs, and every region is different. Um, but in general, for us in California, you can absolutely do this in your uh, Medicare population. Right now, there are very, very few commercial payers that do cover peripheral nerve stimulation across the country. I do know of regions uh, outside of California that do allow for this. Um, we are working hard from a society level to improve access to care. Yes, we have a lot to do as far as evidence basis in, in peripheral nerve stimulation. We're way behind on that compared to a lot of the other therapies you're hearing about this weekend. So as soon as we develop that condition-specific evidence, then go to the payers, we, we hope to see this expand. And, and as you heard from me yesterday, we now have this, we have a growing number of, of companies, and I already know about two other companies that are gonna come to market hopefully in the next couple of years uh, with their own ways of doing peripheral nerve simulation. Well, excellent. All right, one last question here. Go ahead. I'm Dr. Naidu, for, uh, for the clunial nerves, do you find that one PNS lead is sufficient for coverage or given you know, the network of nerves that you need more than one? Great question. It just depends on the patient. So if the pain is quite focal and you think you can capture, you know, those few branches of the superior clunial like we did in this situation, then one lead is sufficient. However, uh, this is one of those conditions where the, the pain is generally a wider swath of geography on the patient. And so absolutely a second lead may be considered. Um, other things to consider are coming more proximal to some of the branch points, which is challenging because, again, it's very web-like along that ilium as far as where to, uh, where to go. Um, and so I think diagnostic blockade can be helpful to some degree, but it requires the patient coming back, you know, a number of times to really get that sweet spot. So uh, absolutely two leads can be used. Um, you do have to identify a separate nerve from a coding standpoint. Uh, so, from a reimbursement standpoint, you don't want you don't get uh, two leads on one nerve, so you want to separate uh, and and designate which nerves you're stimulating.